We come now to Genesis chapter 33, which concerns the meeting of Jacob and Esau. Some 20 years before the events of Genesis chapter 33, Jacob had left the land of Canaan, gone eastward, uh, found refuge with the family of his wife, uh, excuse me, the family of his mother, Rebekah, uh, married uh, his uncle's daughters, his cousins, Leah, Rachel. He had uh, 11 sons and one daughter, became very wealthy in possessions and was now coming back to the promised land, the land of Canaan, to meet his brother Esau once again, his brother who had vowed to kill him 20 years before. Now, God gave Jacob many reasons to be confident in God's protection. God promised to protect Jacob. God gave Jacob the unique uh, appearance of angels and told him that there's a second camp with him, that, that he's not alone, that there's angelic protection. And then at the end of Genesis chapter 32, there was this very unique occurrence where uh, a man and in the whole context, we see that it was God himself in a human appearance. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, appearing in a human form before his incarnation at Bethlehem, wrestled with Jacob at the end of Genesis chapter 32 and blessed him and again gave him further reason to have assurance and to put away fear before this meeting uh, between Jacob and Esau that's going to take place here in this chapter. So Genesis chapter 33, beginning now at verse 1. Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were four hundred men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Jacob heard that Esau was on his way with a large group of men. Genesis chapter 32 verse 6 describes it as 400 men, as we read here in verse 1 as well. Jacob now sees this massive group coming towards his family, and he actually had to trust in God's promises of protection now that the crisis was actually upon him. And look how Jacob responds. Did you notice that in verse 1? It says that he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. Now, these preparations were not necessarily examples of unbelief or reliance on human wisdom and strength. Yet, the order of the groups showed that Jacob openly favored Rachel and her son Joseph because he put Rachel and Joseph last. In other words, if there was a hostile intent upon Esau and the 400 men with him, they would have to fight through, which shouldn't be too difficult to do, everybody and come to Rachel and Joseph last of all. But he put, verse 2 says, the maidservants and their children in front. Leah and her children were more protected than the two maidservants, Bilhah and Zilpah, and their respected children. But now in verse 3, we have the, uh, the final fateful meeting between Jacob and Esau. We read here in Genesis chapter 33, verse 3, Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. You see, after being conquered by God, that was back at the end of Genesis chapter 32, Jacob now led the procession to meet Esau. Of course, the gifts had already gone before. Jacob had hoped to bribe Esau with a series of gifts of goats and sheep and camels and cattle and, and whatnot. But, but now, after that, Jacob, instead of remaining at the rear of the group, he leads the procession. That, that displays some change of character in Jacob as well as does this in verse 3 that says that he bowed himself to the ground. Now again, back in chapter 32, it described the gifts that Jacob had sent over to Esau. Very generous gifts, intended, uh, basically intended to bribe Esau's favor. 
And by them, though, not only did he hope to bribe Esau, but he also wanted to show, brother, I have plenty. I don't need to take anything from you. So he had already demonstrated that, which was a, a, a wise thing to demonstrate. But then, by bowing down, that's what it says there in verse 3, bowing himself to the ground, he showed that he was submitted to his brother, and he wanted no social power over him. And friends, let's remember, some 20 years before this, Jacob had tried to superstitiously steal the blessing from Esau. And if Jacob had not superstitiously tried to steal the blessing some 20 years before, I think all of this would have been unnecessary. Esau and Jacob could have had a good parting. But now Isaac's promise to Jacob let people serve before you and let nations bow down to you, be master over your brethren, it maybe would have been fulfilled sooner rather than later. Look, eventually, Jacob and his descendants will be exalted over Esau and his descendants. But in the meantime, right here in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 33, it's Jacob bowing down to Esau. You know, it's still common today for believers to suffer problems trying to accomplish what they think to be God's will. Or in unbelief, they try to protect themselves with merely human energy and wisdom. Jacob had this promise, but out of fear and unbelief and self-reliance, he looked to himself to fulfill God's promise instead of letting the Lord do it. Now look, there is a passive inactivity that Christians and followers of God need to avoid, but but the basic thing is that God never needs his people to sin in the effort to help him fulfill his plan in their lives. And Jacob at times had done this. And this affected how the plan of God rolled out. It didn't defeat the plan of God. No, God's plan will never be defeated. But it may affect how we experience it. Now, starting here at verse 4. But Esau ran to meet him. Just stop right there. I wonder what Jacob felt when he bowed down from some considerable distance. He bowed down before his brother Esau, and then Esau starts running at him. I wonder if Jacob thought at that moment, oh man, this is it. I'm going to die for sure now. But let me begin again here, verse 4. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maidservants came near, they and their children, and bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. So, after Esau runs to meet him, the blessed result of that is, verse 4, he fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Esau's weeping was because he had met his twin brother again after more than 20 years of separation. But notice it says that they wept. Jacob's tears were probably from relief that his brother had not murdered him and his family in revenge. Again, as Esau had previously vowed 20 years before. You'll find that in Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. And what I love about this very brief description of the meeting, and look, we'll admit, this is a brief, it's an abbreviated description of their meeting, but, but it doesn't include any mention of trying to discuss and resolve the past. You see, God had worked in the heart of Esau, and he had worked in the heart of Jacob. And there was no need to discuss or argue over it all again. What was past was past. And now Esau was simply delighted to see Jacob with his very large family. He says in verse 5, Who are these with you? And Jacob had the opportunity then to introduce his large family 
to his brother Esau. We can just imagine him going down the list. Well, this is Reuben. This is Simeon. This is Levi. This is uh, uh, Judah. And then going down the list. Now, uh, beginning at verse 8. Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I meant? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, No, please, if I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face as though as I have seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. So he urged him, and he took it. Well, if you remember from last chapter, Jacob sent aside a very generous gift. He sent a head, I should say, a very generous gift, uh, a gift of uh, goats and sheep and cattle and camels and whatnot. Donkeys were included. And, and he sent all this very generous gift, hoping to bribe his brother into not slaughtering him, but also to show him that he didn't need anything from him. Esau's response to the gift is beautiful. In verse 8, what do you mean by all this company which I met? You see, Jacob's generous gifts, I would say, confused Esau. He, he didn't expect this. He didn't think, yeah, what's my brother going to do for me to, uh, to placate me? What's he going to do to ease my anger? No, uh, he didn't have any sense of superiority over Jacob. Nor did he seem to have a strong sense that Jacob owed him something. Instead, Esau gives this beautiful testimony. Please notice these words from verse 9. Esau says, I have enough. Friends, that's a blessed testimony. For anybody to be able to say, I have enough, it means that they have what first timothy chapter 6 verse 6 will later say about godliness it says godliness with contentment is great gain esau had that most precious of gifts the gift of contentment and friends it doesn't matter how much you have if you don't have contentment in your heart and soul you are a poor person no, true riches are not found just in an abundance of what a person has, but even more so in contentment. And when Esau said those blessed words, I have enough, it shows what a blessed work had been done in his heart. Now, what I find wonderful about this is in that passage that I just read to you, verses 9, 10, and 11, Esau says, I have enough in verse 9. Jacob says, I have enough in verse 11. Both Esau and Jacob had this very blessed testimony that they could both say, I have enough. And in particular, I say with Esau that his peace and contentment showed him to be a remarkably blessed man. Listen, let's be honest here. Esau did not receive the promise of the Abrahamic covenant. That was passed to Isaac and not to Esau. In regard to the passing of the covenant, uh, Jacob was loved and Esau was hated. No doubt about it. But yet Esau was a blessed man. Remarkably blessed. I like what Spurgeon said about this. He said this, quote, Although Esau did not receive the great blessing, the covenant blessing, that having gone to Jacob, who secured it by deception, Yet Esau did receive a great blessing of a temporal kind, which Isaac pronounced upon him with all the fervor of a father who loved his son most ardently. Esau thus received what he most wanted, for he cared very little for the spiritual blessing, not being a spiritual man. And when he obtained the temporal blessing, that satisfied his heart, and he said, It is enough. So, Jacob, nevertheless, even though Esau protested, I have enough, my brother. Yet Jacob wanted Esau to receive the gift. Verse 11 says, so he urged him and he took it. Esau's receiving of the gifts 
was as important to the reconciliation as Jacob's giving of the gifts. When Jacob gave such generous gifts, it was his way of saying to Esau, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did to you, brother. And when Esau accepted the gifts, it was his way of accepting Jacob and saying he was forgiven. You know, in, in that culture, at least at some times, one never accepted a gift from an enemy. You'd only accept a gift from a friend. And so for Esau to accept the gift was to acknowledge and to accept the friendship. Now, verse 12. Then Esau said, let us take our journey. Let us go and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are weak and the flocks and herds which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock that can go before me and the children are able to endure until I have come to my Lord in Seir. And Esau said, now let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth, built himself a house, and made booths for his livestock. Therefore the name of that place is called Sukkoth. Jacob was glad to be reconciled with his brother, but he didn't want to be too close to him. He was still seemed afraid of Esau in some sense. That's why he says in verse 14, please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. And that's what he did. Verse 17 says that Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth. Now I want you to remember something. At the end of Genesis chapter 32, God gave Jacob the name Israel. The name Jacob in its original cultural meaning meant heel grabber, and it had a very negative association. Someone who was a rascal, a scoundrel, a con man, a deceiver. Those were all bound up in that name heel grabber or Jacob. And God graciously and beautifully gave Jacob a new name. He gave him the name Israel, which there's some debate as to what Israel exactly means. I'm going to suggest to you that it means God rules. A beautiful, powerful name. Now, unfortunately, here in chapter 33, verse 17, Jacob is still acting like old Jacob, the heel catcher, the rascal, the scoundrel, the deceiver. He's acting like old Jacob instead of new Israel. Because Jacob told Esau that he would go far to the south with Esau to the area of Mount Seir. Instead, he allowed Esau to go a few days beyond him to the south. And then Jacob headed north towards Sukkoth. Isn't that funny? Jacob here, lying, deceiving, his own brother, with whom he has just reconciled, not believing, not trusting, that he could really uh, find security and that God would protect him in regard with his brother. Friends, it's hard to be Jacob and Israel at the same time. In Jesus Christ, God's people have been made new men and new women. If you are born again by God's Spirit, God has given you a new identity in Jesus Christ. And you can still, at least in some way, live according to the old nature, according to the old name, if you please, at least to some extent. But friends, why hurt yourself that way? Jacob should have left being Jacob behind, and he should have started living as Israel, as the one whom God rules. But he found it hard to do that. He's sort of living as a combination of both names. He's either Jakael or Israel Ob. But he's trying to combine the two 
when he should just say, Jacob is dead. Israel is alive. That's what God does for the believer, for the person who's born again by his spirit. The old man is dead. The new man lives in Jesus Christ. And friends, that's the identity that we need to endeavor to walk in as followers of Jesus Christ. But Jacob didn't do it. Instead, he travels south, excuse me, north to Sukkoth. And there, verse 17 says, that he built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Now, I find this fascinating. The mention of a building of a house. God had appointed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to live in the land, but to live in tents as sojourners. The building of a house was disobedient. I would even say that it was an unwise settling down. Friends, um, God wanted his patriarchs to live in Canaan, but to live there as sojourners, as travelers. Here we see Jacob settling down. It's the only reference to a house being built by either Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. Now, let's continue on here. Verse 18. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padam Aram. And he pitched his tent before the city, and he brought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected an altar there and called it El Elohe Israel. Now, it was good that Jacob came back to the promised land, to Canaan. It was good that he settled there. But I'm going to suggest to you that he came short of full obedience, because it seems that God directed him to return to Bethel. Back in Genesis chapter 31, verse 13, God said, return to Bethel. But now, instead of going to Bethel, Jacob goes to Shechem. And let me tell you something. This time in Shechem will not be good for Jacob and his family. No, he disobeyed God. God told him to go to Bethel. But he goes to Shechem instead. No, friends, I, I, I believe that Jacob genuinely had this profound experience with God uh, in Genesis chapter 32 when the man wrestled with Jacob and there was some kind of breakthrough, if I could use that phrase, I kind of hesitate to use it because it's a misused word, but there was some kind of breakthrough in his uh, relationship with God and his thinking towards God. But we can see there's still a battle that continues in Jacob. And here he told Esau, I'll go with you, I'll follow you to Mount Seir. But he didn't go there. He went northward. He went the opposite direction to Shechem. We see that God told him to go to Bethel. Back in Genesis chapter 31, verse 13. But he doesn't. He goes to Shechem. And he's built a house and dwells there. But there was something good here. I don't want to say that it was all negative. If you look at verse 20, it says this. Then... He erected an altar there and called it El Eloha Israel. That was good for Jacob to build an altar. And presumably he made sacrifices to God there on that altar. That's the whole idea of building an altar. The altar was good. Hooray for you, is, uh, Jacob, for doing that. But you know what would have been better than building an altar and making sacrifices? doing what God told you to do. What would have been better was being honest with your brother Esau and not lying to him. What would have been better was doing what God told you to do in returning to Bethel, but instead you go to Shechem. Friends, God wants obedience first and then sacrifice. There are people who are sacrificially serving the Lord and praise God for it, but they're doing it with some known or glaring area of disobedience in their life. 
dear brother or sister, thank the Lord for your service for him, but obey first, then bring your sacrifice. There are people who sacrificially give to God's work. Praise the Lord for that. It's wonderful when God channels resources through his people and through their obedience and generosity, they help to fund the work that God does in this world. Praise the Lord for that. But God wants your obedience first, then your sacrifice. So I'm not trying to say that the altar that Jacob built in verse 20 was bad. But sacrifice without obedience, it always leaves something lacking, something wrong. Friends, Jacob and his family will suffer in this wasted, disobedient period of his life, even though it came right after God had dramatically displayed himself through the company of angels at the beginning of Genesis chapter 32. God dramatically displayed himself in the man who wrestled with Jacob at the end of Genesis 32. God dramatically displayed himself in the changed heart of Esau when Jacob met him in the beginning of this chapter, Genesis 33. Yet Jacob still went on after that to a season of disobedience. Friends, doesn't this show us how much we just simply need to continually rely on the Lord? And if God is moving your heart to get an area in your life with Him right before Him, there's some area of known disobedience that you're just clinging to, you're, 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 you're seizing on it, you won't let it go before the Lord. Is this not right now God's call to you? to say, Lord, no, I'm going to stop the compromise. I'm going to stop the disobedience. Not that you can perfectly obey, but you, you know the difference between some area of disobedience that you're not really aware of and, and something that you know about and God's speaking to you about, yet you're clinging to. You put that all away and you say, Lord, this is just for you. I'm, I'm going to obey you first. Then I'm going to make a glad sacrifice unto you. Now, before we leave Genesis chapter 33, let's look at just a few ways that it points to Jesus Christ. And listen, I'm not trying to be exhaustive here. I'm going to suggest to you a couple ways that Genesis 33 points to Jesus, but I'm sure that you can think of more. And if you do, leave some kind of response, uh, something in the comments, an email, wh whatever it is, however you can respond to us. I'd be interested to know what you see God um, displaying himself in the form of Jesus Christ through Genesis chapter 33, which may go beyond these few ones I'm going to mention to you right now. So here's the first way I would say. In contrast to Jacob, Jesus does not divide his family into favor and unfavored, protected and unprotected. You remember how Jacob did that at the beginning of this chapter. He puts the least favored mothers and sons in the front of the group, figuring if they get slaughtered, I'll be less sad. Now, look, maybe a very, you know, sensible thing to do to protect some more than others. But friends, he's shouting to his family, I love more some than others. Friends, Jesus doesn't do that with his family. Jesus doesn't divide his family into favored and unfavored, protected and unprotected. Jesus loves and cares for them all. Now, that is not to say that all the followers of Jesus have the same experience or they all endure the same trials. But those differences reflect the purposes and wisdom of God's plan. They do not reflect differences in God's care. They do not reflect differences in his affection for his people. That's one way that I see Genesis chapter 33 points to Jesus. Let me show you a second way. Jacob humbled himself when he came before Esau. He bowed to the ground seven times, verse 3 mentions. Well, friends, Jesus humbled himself when he came to live among humanity. 
And I don't know how much you like to make about the numbers in the Bible. M many people regard the number seven as a number of completion, fulfillment. Some people say perfection, but actually the idea is more completion or fulfillment. Friends, think about this. You could say that Jacob humbled himself completely before Esau. Well, Jesus humbled himself completely when he came to live among humanity. And then third and last, let me just say this. The way that Esau greeted Jacob reminds us of the words of Jesus in the parable of the lost son. We usually call it the parable of the prodigal son. In Genesis chapter 33, verse 4, it says this, Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. Okay, that's what Genesis chapter 33, verse 4 says about the meeting of Esau with Jacob. Listen to this in Luke chapter 15, verse 20. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Just as much as God affected a beautiful reconciliation between these two par parties at enmity, one with the other, Esau and Jacob. So, in a greater sense, God affects a beautiful and powerful reconciliation between himself and us, illustrated by the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. And God was even careful to use some of the same terminology fell on his neck, ran, ran, fell on his neck and kissed him in both of these stories. Friends, I, I hope that's you. I hope that you've enjoyed that reconciliation with God that is available to all of humanity in Jesus Christ. That you would trust in, rely on, and cling to Jesus Christ in who he is, according to what the Bible says, not according to your or anybody else's imagination, but according to what the Bible is, that you would trust in who he is and what he has done for you, especially what he did at the cross and in his resurrection. Being a payment for your sins at the cross and triumphing over sin and death in his resurrection. If you'll trust in, rely on, and cling to Jesus Christ, in who he is and what he did, especially at the cross and the resurrection, then you can know that joy of, figuratively speaking, God running to you, embracing you, falling on your neck, and kissing you. That's the reconciliation that God worked between Jacob and Esau in Genesis 33, and that Jesus illustrated with his parable of the lost son, the prodigal son, in Luke chapter 15. I pray that's yours. Father, that is my prayer. We're grateful that you do this continual work of reconciliation. You reconcile us with you in the person and work of Jesus Christ, and you reconcile parties among men. They're at enmity with each other. Lord, I, I pray any person viewing or listening to this that needs reconciliation either with you or with a brother or sister that they need to be reconciled with lord would you do that by your power by your grace thank you for your goodness lord we pray this in jesus precious name amen